We learn about the moment an American president became convinced a Colorado-based company had rigged the election. And I told them that it was that it was uh, crazy stuff, and they were wasting their time on that. Coloradans arrested and accused of plotting a white supremacist attack, digging into why people joined these groups. Answering your ballot questions, celebrating your generosity for farmers and families, and explaining why we can't see the Stanley Cup during the final. Lots to do, so let's get going on Next. So much about the big lie of the 2020 election came out of Colorado. We've been talking about it together for a year, and today's January 6th committee hearing laid out more claims that were, well, the stuff you get from the west end of a bull facing east. I told him that the stuff that his people were shoveling out to the public were bull, was bull. I mean, that the claims of fraud were bull. And, uh, you know, he was indignant about that. Steaming piles of election misinformation came out of Colorado, like how Denver based Dominion voting systems supposedly conspired with Antifa to rig the election. President Trump's own attorney general, Bill Barr, told him that those claims were both unfounded and profoundly dumb. I reiterated that they wasted a whole month on these claims on the Dominion voting machines, and they were idiotic claims. So who would believe that bull excrement? We have a company that's very suspect. Its name is Dominion. With the turn of a dial or the change of a chip, you can press a button for Trump and the vote goes to Biden. What kind of a system is this? It's not clear if President Trump believed the lies coming out of Colorado or if he just thought that his supporters would buy them. I was somewhat demoralized because I thought, boy, if he really believes this stuff, he has, you know, lost contact with, uh, with uh, he's become detached from reality if he really believes this stuff. Another Colorado connection came up in today's January 6th hearing when the committee discussed efforts to grift money from Trump supporters. A man from Castle Rock helped collect tens of millions of dollars from Trump supporters to privately build the border wall with Mexico. He's accused of pocketing some of that money. His trial just ended in mistrial. Third Colorado connection at the close of today's hearing, as we heard how President Trump's attorney, Eric Hirschman, reacted to the University of Colorado visiting Professor John Eastman's plan to overthrow American democracy. Hirschman testified he told Eastman, quote, are you out of your bleeping mind? So, you know, it used to be typical to ask after terrorist plots were uncovered, where were they radicalized? For whatever reason, we don't tend to ask that about alleged white supremacist attacks. We both know the reason. There's no need for you to shout it at your TV. So after three Coloradans turned up in the group of 31 suspected white supremacists arrested for conspiracy to riot in Idaho, our Steve Sager asked the question, where were they radicalized? That level of preparation is not something you see every day. Not many new details Monday about the plan foiled on Saturday when police in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, arrested 31 men found in the back of a U-Haul in matching clothes with shields, shin guards, and a smoke grenade. It was very clear to us immediately that this was a riotous group. Those facing a misdemeanor charge of conspiracy to riot include three Coloradans in their 20s, three men from the suburbs of Denver who traveled more than a thousand miles to make an apparent hateful statement near a pride event. Investigators say they are part of a white supremacy group called Patriot Front. What we found is that it usually does start with a personal issue. Dr. Rachel Nielsen is a public safety psychologist who studies extremism. It's given her insight into how people get to the point that they're willing to do what we saw this weekend. Usually it's about identity and belonging and a sense of ego. What we find is when people start to get upset over something in their personal life and they start blaming other people and externalizing that responsibility, then they're really vulnerable to a lot of the social media uh, rhetoric and they can get swept up into movements that they previously had nothing to do with. The social media part of that is key. It's why we're seeing extreme thought circles grow. You don't have to meet someone in real life or have someone uh, in your neighborhood or in your community. A lot of us know now how the algorithms work that the more you look at concerning content, um, aggressive, violent content, the more the internet gives you even more of that. Dr. Nielsen says if you know someone who's pulled away, 
saying concerning things, the best thing you can do is talk to them. If you want to keep the individual talking, there's something there that's going on that's making them angry. That Patriot Front group was formed out of the events in Charlottesville, Virginia in 2017. That event emboldened these folks, which Nielsen says is actually pretty rare. She says typically when you see an event like Charlottesville or January 6th or even the arrest at the Pride event, Kyle, that most people who are just dipping their toes into these hateful ideas, yeah. when they see that violent event, they tend to move away because they don't want to get involved in that. I would have, I would have thought the opposite. That this kind of thing serves as a recruiting event. They see an event like that, you know, the tiki torch guys in khakis, you know, shouting about Jews, and they decide that they want to get involved. But you're saying that, that most of those folks who are on the periphery decide, I don't want that. No, Nielsen says just a sliver of people who might see something like that might say, ooh, I feel emboldened to join this mm. group and to do something like that. But really, it pushes more people away than anything. Interesting. Steve, thank you. Have you voted yet? Should have received your ballot last week. Unaffiliated, Republican, Democrat, they all went out. And we know that a bunch of you got them because you've been sending us your next questions about the ballot. Politics guy Marshall Zellinger starts off a string with the one about races with no competition. Our first next question comes from a few of you. Kellen from Jefferson County provided the visual aid. It's about ballots with no contested races, meaning one candidate to choose from. Roger from Douglas County and Sandra from Larimer County all had variations of the same question. What's the reason for sending out a ballot with only one person in each race? The short answer, state law. Since Kellen sent us their Jeffco example, I'll let Democratic Jefferson County Clerk George Stern elaborate. If either the Republicans or the Democrats have a contested race anywhere on that ballot, then I have to send ballots for all races in both of the major parties. If there were no contested races anywhere in the state of Colorado on anything, then correct. Primaries canceled. We move on to uh, we move on to the general election. Sandra added another question: Is there any point in completing and returning a ballot with no contested races? Marcy from Adams County asked, "What, if anything, does it mean if I don't fill in the circle?" Simply returning a ballot, whether it is blank or filled in, counts as you having voted. But there are other reasons to return it, even if you do not fill in the bubbles. Mail it back. It also practically gives us your most recent signature. So we're comparing your signature in November with the, the an even more recent signature on file. It lets us know that uh, your information's up to date, that you, you are indeed still living at that home because you voted from that home and signed a ballot from that home. Arthur is one of a few unaffiliated voters who has asked, what if you want to vote for races on both the Democratic and Republican ballots? Most unaffiliated voters get both ballots, but you can only return one. If you return both, we are required state law to discard both. We can't assume your intent. We can't look at which one we pulled out first and say, oh, he must have wanted to vote in this one because he filled out more races in this one than the other one. For next, I'm Marshall Zellinger. 1.6 million of us unaffiliated voters in Colorado got both ballots. Again, stress, do not return both. Pick one, Republican or Democrat, if you would like to vote in a primary. You don't have to. It doesn't change your registration to a party. If you do, you'll still be unaffiliated. You just have the right to vote in one or the other. You have till 7 p.m. June 28th to get your ballot back to your county clerk. And keep those questions coming. Firefighters in Swatch County are hoping to finally get some containment tonight on a wildfire that started on Sunday. We've got some new video of the Lopez fire, which is burning about 10 miles north of the town of Del Norte. U.S. Forest Service says they've been able to hold this thing at 88 acres. More fire crews came in this morning to join the fight. People living in the La Garita Creek area are being told to stay on alert if that fire starts to move. They don't have anything official on a cause, though there was lightning reported in that area yesterday. You're good people, you know that? For a whole bunch of different reasons, but most recently, specifically, because you raised nearly $30,000 that will be used to buy fresh produce from Colorado's farms and then fill the shelves at Food Bank of the Rockies. It's a win-win for those farm families and for those families in need. I have another win-win idea for you for Wednesday's Word of Thanks microgiving campaign. So far, you have raised $9.1 million over 105 weeks of giving here together. Like I said, you're good people. With some good ideas, too, on which nonprofits could use our help. If you know of one in your community, let me know. I read each and every email that comes to next at 9news.com. Colorado's black businesses are getting the chance not only to survive, but thrive, thanks to a new community program. Again, it's allowing me to push my business forward and having somebody there to hold me accountable. 
An audit shows the state's screening process for sports betting operations is about as effective as that security guard in the me. All right, going through. And if you had plans to see the Stanley Cup before the final starts here in Denver, cancel it. fans hoping to catch a glimpse of the Stanley Cup before or during the series against the Lightning when it starts on Wednesday? Sorry, out of luck. The Hockey Hall of Fame tells us no public showings in Colorado ahead of the final. That's a departure from past practice. Next viewer named Richard reminded us the greatest trophy in sports typically goes on display in the cities where the final is played. He remembered an event at the Marriott Southeast Hotel in 1996, then at the Aurora Mall in 2001. This is the time when the cup actually came to Nine News. Uh, Richard's right. The cup also appeared at the Westminster Mall and the Villa Italia Mall in 2001. It's been here when the Avs have played in the final before. The Hockey Hall of Fame said there's no public showing of the cup in Colorado this time around. They specifically cited common superstitions about having the cup around, or I guess like touching it prior to winning it. They say the cup will be present at a media day event. That's tomorrow. New audit shows some holes in Colorado's new sports betting setup. When voters approved this in 2019, it was estimated that legalized sports betting would bring in $15 million a year, supposed to go to the state's water plan. Last year, water plan got $8 million from gamblers' losings. Today, an audit on how the state handles the fund shows that the state did not complete background checks on most of its sports betting operators. The audit found three out of five operators sampled, 60%, did not have the required criminal background check. Three out of five also didn't have their full regulatory history investigated. The Colorado Department of Revenue was asked by state legislators today why this investigation process is so flimsy. As we were ramping this up, um, we had issues of hiring freeze, which uh, higher, a higher salary wouldn't help when you can't hire. Um, we had COVID um, as well that was limiting our ability to be able to get people on board, train them, be able to bring people in to do those investigations. State Department of Revenue Director Mark Ferrandino, who you heard from there, was asked if the state would consider paying investigators big time salaries to get more candidates if this is such an important job. He was asked, like, what if it was a half million dollar a year job? Could they find good candidates? Ferrandino said that'd be tough to justify to the state's budget committee. Another day, another record. Okay, it was a record tie, but 99 degrees here in Denver. That, that ties our old record that was actually set back in 2006, but it was sizzling, not just here in the metro area, but look at all of these 100 degree temperatures across the eastern plains into northern Colorado. Even up in the high country, it was a warm afternoon in the 80s around Steamboat through Kremlin and 97 in Grand Junction. You probably saw the smoke and the haze today. It's still around, but I do have some good news coming our way. Look at this. I'm going to be watching a cold front pushing in probably about 11 o'clock to midnight tonight with those northerly winds that should shift all of the smoke to the south and then as we go throughout the day tomorrow it starts to migrate just a bit off to the eastern plains but a vast improvement compared to what we were looking at today still a couple of light little showers starting to pop up around far northwestern colorado there's the cold front it's going to clip the northern mountains but really will feel the effects of the cooler temperatures tomorrow and on wednesday too again most of the moisture staying well to our north. Tomorrow, daytime highs, pretty typical for this time of the year in the low to mid 80s. We will take it. Some spots in the 90s off to the eastern plains. I know another warm up is here. Thursday and Friday, we are back to the mid to upper 90s. The weekend arrives. Father's Day, I will be tracking a few afternoon storms. Fresh help when black owned businesses needed it most. We actually thrived throughout the pandemic and were able to actually grow. And it's a sign of shelter in a storm for some of you. Next. The coal is all gone from one of Colorado's last coal power plants. Now there are new natural gas generators standing in place of the piles. The Drake power plant off I-25 in Colorado Springs burned its last load of coal last summer. And they've cleaned up that big coal pit outside that was so visible. Last month, they brought in new natural gas generators. Two generators are there now, and a third's coming in a couple of weeks. They're smaller than the old coal stacks that used to tower over the interstate. They can start up faster than the coal ones did, get power out within minutes. Colorado Springs Utility says they'll start generating power in either the fall or early winter. 
They're meant to be used on days when demand for energy is especially high. Black-owned businesses struggled significantly, like any other business, during the pandemic. They went into the pandemic, though, under-resourced and undercapitalized, according to the Colorado Black Business Initiative. Our Byron Reed tells us about a new foundation that aims to change that playing field. For the past three years, we do interior and exterior painting. Evan Simmons has been busy carefully crafting a canvas for his new business. It was actually very scary once the pandemic hit, obviously being a new uh, business owner and leaving the security of that corporate um, job. But um, overall, it's been a great transition. Um, we stayed extremely busy through the pandemic. Simmons is the owner of Panoramic Pro Painting, a company he started in 2019. He says he's seen his business expand since they started and wants to see that trend continue. When I started the journey of entrepreneurship, I always told myself that I would be open to exploring different avenues and um, you know things that could help uh, me grow the business. So he reached out to the AYA Foundation. And it means abundance and affluence. Launched by Colorado's Black Business Initiative that provides resources to help support black business owners and entrepreneurs. A lot of times we don't have the support or someone like walking with us on this journey to say like, I can do it, so. To know Emmanuel is the foundation's director of programming and strategic initiatives. She says they're providing about 20 black businesses the ability to create social change and help close the wealth gap for the black community. And giving them access to things that they otherwise wouldn't have access to, like access to capital. A lot of us are small business owners and entrepreneurs, and we're building that community. So what does it look like to be able to support that in a way that um, promotes growth and sustainability. And it's allowing me to push my business forward and having somebody there to hold me accountable um, and to provide that roadmap. It's a map that Simmons hopes will provide a framework and an extra code of knowledge to help his company make a great impression. It's been amazing for my business and something that I definitely wouldn't be in the place I am today without. For next, I'm Byron Reed. Foundation says it targets its work on capital and marketing, which it sees as the two largest hurdles for black owned businesses. It's a sign and it raises more questions than it answers. And I will answer one of your questions tonight. This one's about white supremacy. Oh joy, that's next. It's a sign that you do not want to see as you're headed to the storm shelter. No, because the storm shelter sign here also has a sign that says employees only. This was at the Best Buy in Longmont. Kevin spotted this one for us. Hoping that they can probably make an exception to that top sign if the bottom sign is in play. You know what I'm saying? Send us the signs you see next at 9news.com's the email or send it to us on Twitter with the hashtag PayNext. Jen writes in with a question about our primary election saying, isn't the whole point of being unaffiliated that you don't have to pick a party or vote along party lines? Why not send one ballot with both parties on it? All the options. Well, because Jen, at the end of the day, the primaries are still a function of each of the parties, so they get say over their functions. Unaffiliated voters just get to choose if they want to play in one or the other. A question about what is the difference between a white nationalist and a white supremacist? Often the terms are interchangeable. A white supremacist believes that whites are superior. A white nationalist believes that they want to carve out a nation for a supreme people. Both of them need new hobbies and interests. We'll see you next time.